focus on recurrent neural networks, which is uh, one of the most powerful models that you learn about in this class. Um, before we go into the lecture, the PSET was due uh, at the latest uh, on Sunday. I hope uh, most of you were able to do it. We had a very, very uh, low amount or uh, number of students uh, who dropped the class, which is great. I'm very happy to see that. Um, this is sort of the first time you know this class has been taught by me at Stanford, but really I think anywhere ever uh, in the sense that uh, a pure sort of deep learning for natural language processing class uh, wasn't around before. So we still have some kinks to, to iron out with the, the problem sets and so on. So thanks for sticking with us. Um, so yeah, if you, I think there are a couple of students maybe who are taking it for pass fail uh, who haven't turned in the homework yet. Um, so if you do that and you now think, well, I'll just do really well in the project and the other problem sets, uh, you do really want to um, get um, get started, uh, really catching up with the class, and because all the other subsequent homeworks will require you to have understood sort of the previous things. So. Um, do come to office hours, do check out the code that I'll show today on, um, you know, in some ways we'll show some of the solutions to the first problem set and a nice sort of clean way to implement a two-layer neural network. Um, yep. All right. Uh, are there any organizational questions around the problem sets or class progression? Yep. How are we supposed to turn in that proposal? Um, how do you suppose to turn in the proposal? Um, boy, I guess... It's, you have to just uh, put it in the instructions, so the instructions are updated. Okay, so the instructions are updated on the website for how to turn the proposal. I think uh, you update it, send it to a box too, or? No, just it send, submit it to the PDF to the score. To the staff mailing list? Or? No, the, the, the score website. There okay, the great. All right. All right, any other questions? Great, so uh, a little overview. Um, we briefly mentioned language models, but I think I can give you some more intuition uh, of how traditional language models actually work. And then uh, I think you'll appreciate RNNs even more because they don't make certain uh, Markov assumptions that are quite unrealistic uh, and traditional language models make, that traditional language models make. Um, but uh, not, not all is uh, green on the other side uh, in RNNs because there are a lot of problems that they have too, namely the vanishing or exploding gradient problems. We'll try to gain a little bit of a mathematical intuition uh, of why, why that is and then show you solutions for, for fixing those. So again, RNNs are similar to uh, other neural nets where if you don't really know how to use them properly, you won't, uh, you won't be able to get them to work. So here uh, we'll cover some, some very important tricks for them and then uh, show you that it, RNNs are useful for more things than just, <laughs> just language modeling. It really can do uh, and solve a lot of other kinds of sequence tasks. And we'll, we'll go briefly into some uh, extensions of RNNs, namely making them bidirectional, as in moving forward in time but also backward in time. And uh, of course, making them deeper, which in many cases helps. All right, language models. So again, we want to basically compute the probability for a sequence of words, W1 to WT, some sequence. And uh, this is very useful for machine translation. So here are two, two examples where a machine translation system might give you multiple outputs uh, when it tried to translate French to English, for instance, and you now want to score them. So maybe you want to assign the sequence the cat is small, a higher probability than small the is cat. Or uh, in terms of word choice, <coughs> maybe you want to assign higher probability walking home after school versus walking house after school. But both house and home might be reasonable translations of the, f the, the French word maison or something like that. Um, and word choice is particularly useful also for uh, for speech recognition, where you may have, um, you know, I would like to know the price of wood. So now I have basically two things that sounded the same, wood and wood, but the price of wood and, you know, I would like to know that kind of wood uh, are different and one would presumably have a higher probability in the sequence. All right, so how do traditional language models work? Uh, basically, <coughs> they condition on a window of n previous words, which is an incorrect but necessary mark of assumption. So in order to get the probability here for uh, the entire sequence, we basically take the product of the probability for each of the single words in that sequence uh, from one to n, 
and ideally we would condition all the previous words starting uh, from the first one but really in practice we'll approximate that in traditional language models by just taking a window of the last n words and of course that is that is a simplifying assumption um, that these kinds of models have to make because the way they actually uh, estimate these probabilities is by taking counts for specific sets of unigrams, bigrams, and generally n-grams that you see. So how do they actually compute the probability for a given word given its window? Well, if that window is just a previous word, so it's uh, basically uh, sort of taking counts of bigrams, uh, then you would basically just take the counts of how often do you see word one followed by word two exactly in that order in your entire corpus, and then you divide by the number of times you saw the first word. And that will essentially give you the probability for the second word given the first. And if you wanted to go to trigrams, you'd have to take all the counts for, you know, word one followed by word two followed by word three and divide by the counts of how often you saw the first two in that order. So just to give you an example, so I wanted to say the cat walks, for instance, I want to get the probability for walks you know, given that I've seen the cat, so I basically take all the counts in a very large corpus, ideally the larger the better, of how often do I see the cat walks, and divide by the cat um, afterwards in those counts. So the performance of these kinds of models improves a lot when you can keep around higher n-gram counts. Uh, and then you do some smoothing and so-called back-off where, let's say, you try to find if you have a foregram that you see exactly at test time. If you don't see it, you just look for the you know, trigram. If you don't see that, you can look for the bigram and so on. And you may also combine all those. The problem is that there are a lot of n-grams as n gets larger. The upper bound is sort of the size of your vocabulary to the power of n the number of n-grams. So there are really a lot of them, uh, many, many uh, tens of thousands of millions for, for tri and, and four and five grams. And so uh, one of the most sophisticated ways uh, uh, to really store these kinds of counts is uh, described uh, in this paper uh, by Ken Hatfield, uh, Scalable Modified Knesserne Language Model Estimation. Uh, Knesserne is a different, a specific type of smoothing. And there, after doing lots of tricks uh, for storing these data structures and storing all these counts, he only needs uh, a machine with 140 gigs of RAM. So just keeping around all these counts here in order to estimate the probabilities in traditional sort of discrete count-based language models takes a lot of RAM. And that is after an insane amount of, uh, of you know, research and optimization to put it into smaller, uh, better, more efficient data structures. So, of course, now if you wanted to actually run your language model on your phone, or since, for instance, that would just not work, right? It's impossible to keep around all those counts uh, as your um, as your corpus gets larger, but ideally you want to train on larger corpora. The larger your corpus is, the better you can estimate what constitutes a reasonable phrase in the English language. So on the other hand, you have recurrent neural networks, uh, which we'll go th over now. Uh, basically, the RNNs tie the weights at each time step, and there are different ways you can describe them. We, we went over them briefly in the last lecture, but basically uh, they allow you to condition neural networks, uh, the, sorry, the condition the probability for each output given the entire sequence of words before by keeping around a uh, hidden state HT. So at each hidden state HT, we have a new word, XT come in, those will be word vectors, and now you want to predict basically uh, the output, namely the next word uh, at xt plus 1, will be your yt. Here, in that case, the RAM, requires, the RAM requirements only scale with the number of words, and you have basically a fixed set of weights w. And those w's could be large. You may want to have a hidden dimensionality of 1,000, so your w would here, here would be 1,000 by 1,000, so you know, that's a million weights. But the nice thing is, even if you have a train with a larger corpus, that will basically be fixed. And it still is able to incorporate more and more longer sequences and, and learn from, from larger corpus. And really, the only thing, again, that, that increases is your lookup table, uh, namely your word vectors. But you know, there's no sort of exponential blow up uh, in the number of n-grams. So 
in particular, this is uh, the most standard definition of a recurrent neural network. We'll look at some others and, and modifications, but in the simplest case, we will basically have a hidden uh, to hidden uh, transformation matrix W here. That one always has to be uh, a square matrix, and in here you remap the word vectors into the hidden state W H X, and so. Just to give you an idea here, we could basically uh, rewrite this as, let's see where I am. We could rewrite that multiplication also in terms of having, <coughs> first time I'm using the <laughs> this. Oh boy, that looks pretty terrible. <laughs> so imagine, oh boy, I don't know if you'll, all right, let's just use the board. Um, you have here WHH, and you could make one larger matrix, WHX, times uh, your vectors uh, HT minus 1 and XT. So now this matrix multiplication is exactly the same as writing out the this here with the plus right and uh, if, if that doesn't make sense you know you basically multiply each line you add them up again at the end um, if that doesn't make sense to write uh, write that out um, with all the indices at home and then you'll you'll see that those are the same um, basically we have just a hidden layer here and then in this case here we apply the sigmoid function but really there are other choices later on and then for each hidden state, we basically have uh, the standard softmax, which in our case will predict the word uh, for language models. All right, here are two other ways people describe them. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of this, this loop uh, way to describe them, but you'll see that in the literature and if you read papers um, also quite commonly. All right, so the main idea here is again that we use the same weights w at all time steps. That way, you know, the sequence can be arbi of arbitrary length and we basically will be able to compute a hidden representation at every given time step. Um, everything else here is the same if we use language models. Uh, here again, we just have a specific initialization vector for the hidden layer at time step zero. This is h zero. Uh, we'll have different dimensionalities here for our hidden states and potentially the word vectors and we'll have our softmax and the case of language modeling has the output of size of the vocabulary. All right, um, so then we have our probability estimates here uh, are over the entire vocabulary and that allows us to use the same cross entropy error that we had used before uh, for various other classes. It just turns out the classes now are the words. So this is the same cross entropy error and here we look at, uh, at time step t, we just sum over the entire vocabulary. Of course, we don't actually have to sum over the entire vocabulary, right? Because there's only a single word. But this is the full definition of the cross entry barrier. All right. Uh, it turns out you could just uh, basically look at the overall um, the negative average of the log probabilities over the entire data set size. Um, so this is basically the cross entry error over the entire sequence, making all the single predictions at all the time steps and then just averaging that. But it turns out that most people prefer to take that, that amount here and to the power of uh, two or the power of two of that, um, of that uh, basically negative average log probabilities, and then call that perplexity. And now you want uh, a lower perplexity uh, is basically better. The less perplexed you are, the more certain you uh, are about predicting the correct next word. Yeah? Can you give some intuition as to why that would not seem perplexity like the word perplexity? Um, so, like, perplexity? that um, I guess confusion kind of. Um, right. So why does raising 
Right, so there are actually some nice, uh, nice intuitions uh, from information theory, but the last time I brought that up, some people complained, and it's really not that necessary. So uh, let's, let's take it offline. Um, but yeah, in, in general, you can kind of think of, uh, um, in this case, it is really not as necessary. KL divergence still was and will become necessary. But um, yeah, there are some nice intuitions there. But really, you can think of the, yeah, the, the more perplexed you are, the worse you're off. All right, so um, one of the main issues with RNNs is that uh, it also you know, comes from the same advantage that we have of having the weights tied or having the same W matrix at every single time step. And so during forward prop again, we have you know, the same W here to compute every time step's hidden vector. And so ideally, um, in theory, if I have, if I make an output, if I have an output here at time step t, a thousand, and maybe 200 time steps before, something really important happened, and I want now that to still modify what comes 100 or 200 time steps later. Uh, however, that uh, is a very hard problem, uh, a very hard problem for RNNs to to really be able to do. And so, one thing I encourage you all to do is write out an RNN with just two or three simple time steps, and then really manually derive the gradients just like you did with you know single and two layer neural networks. It will be very very instructive and helpful, insightful for you to do that. So. Let's look a little bit into the so-called vanishing or exploding gradient problem. So these are two different kinds of problems that may arise from having the same W here at every time step. Basically, because we multiply the same matrix at each time step during forward propagation, we'll have to do the same thing uh, during backwards propagation. And so just to give you an intuition here, as we have, you know, we have an error term here at every single time step, right? So you have et minus one, et, and et plus one. And now, if we want to minimize our error at et plus one, then we'll propagate those signals all the way down, all the way through the network. So down to xt plus one, and then to ht, and then to xt, and you know, this basically uh, continues. We keep, you know, propagating that error all the way until, in theory, the first. Uh, time step. So let's uh, try to write that all out and uh, in order to simplify some of the notation and analysis here we'll have a slightly different RNN formulation but when, if you write that actually out it boils down to almost exactly the same way we just apply the nonlinearities at a later step. Uh, so here we'll define our hidden uh, step to be computed with just a linear transformation times a nonlinearity of the previous hidden state plus uh, our word to hidden matrix WHX times the word vector at XT. So now here, uh, notice how I dropped the superset, uh, oh, sorry, the superscript W here, just for notational convenience. And then we have here, we then basically apply the nonlinearity only in when we compute Y, uh, our prediction. And this is, again, could be the same softmax here, but let's, for simplicity, drop the softmax and just have linear scores. A lot of the math uh, is, is very similar, but it'll be easier to write out. So uh, now let's look at the total error um, of the entire sequence. Again, that will be the sum of the errors at every time step t. And let's take the derivative with respect to w, which is the hidden weights, and those again uh, replicate at every time step. So now. Um, We'll have to go slowly because we'll apply the chain rule many, many times. And after you know, doing it three or four times, you uh, may get lost if you don't concentrate. So um, let's do the first chain rule for now the error at a specific time step t. So again, we're, we may have you know, a long uh, document. We have you know, 500 time steps. And now we want to predict the 501st word. So now, uh, in order to do that, we basically will have to sum over all the previous um, time steps that we had, and then apply the chain rule here. So we'll have the partial of the error at time step t with respect to yt, our outputs, and then uh, partial of yt with respect to our hidden t. But now, uh, this actually hidden t is computed uh, using all the previous hidden states at previous time steps. 
right? So we'll have here, uh, we'll have to basically sum over all of these, and each of these will have w inside in order to compute that hidden state. So now, of course, that particular element here, ht of hk, will also have to have the chain rule, right? Because ht, uh, the partial of ht with respect to hk, which is uh, smaller, will, you know, we sum here from k equals 1 up to t. Um, so now, again, remember this is how we computed uh, our hidden state ht. It basically is just going over this. So now we have the chain rule again because here we'll have ht is basically dependent on ht minus 1, which depends on ht minus 2, which depends on ht minus 3, and so on, all the way to k plus 1. All right, now when we try to take this derivative here, hj and hj minus 1 are both vectors. So when we want to write that out, that basically becomes uh, the so-called Jacobian, which is basically just the uh, a matrix of all the first order derivatives uh, for in each row here, we'll basically have the first element, so hj1 in our case, with respect to all the elements of hj minus 1 comma m. So basically this is just all the, all, all the derivatives but with respect to a vector valued function f and a vector, value, uh, a vector of parameters x. Okay, so now uh, from the previous slide here we basically wanted to compute uh, the parts of ht with respect to hk and again this is the sum for all the previous ones um, which again in some ways is just applying the chain rule. Uh, now, in order to compute this Jacobian, uh, what I would encourage you to do, it's really fairly straightforward, is to again derive each element of the matrix here. So when I def define the Jacobian here, it basically boils down to having exactly, um, you know, each of these elements here. So for each element of M, uh, you basically take the derivative with respect to all the other elements uh, of J minus 1 of N. And you know, if you write this out here, you can basically see immediately how you can ignore this part because h doesn't appear in the second part of the sum. And then here again, you could write out, you know, in order to compute h j, the jth element, you look at the jth row of w. You have an inner product here, and take derivatives, and you write out your inner product in terms of a sum, and you'll quickly see. Um, a pattern, uh, but then there's a sort of another trick that we haven't really discussed that much, which is how do you create from that pattern that you'll observe once you take these derivatives here, how do you actually get that into a nice matrix formulation? And uh, this is one such trick here, where basically the derivative of each of these uh, with respect to just the previous hidden state will be W transpose, that one is uh, pretty similar to what you've derived before, times the diagonal of F primes. So F here is again just F primes, right? And so uh, the diagonal of this uh, you know, uh, derivative vector here is basically in this notation where we define uh, all the elements on the diagonal to be exactly the elements of that vector and all the off-diagonal elements are zero. And this will allow us to exactly define uh, this HJM uh, of each of the elements times uh, the F primes here. And again, this sounds a little hard, but once you just write all this out and you write out you know, a little example matrix of you know, two by two or three by three hidden states by hand, you'll see that this is uh, you know, somewhat Yes? What was the Z? Sorry, Z is just the de definition here of the diagonal. So it's just, a, just to define uh, what, what I mean by diag. So in our case here, this would be the diag of F prime of HJ minus 1. And then you have here at each element, this, the first one would be F prime of HJ minus 1 comma 1. All right, 
definitely do check at home uh, that you make and make sure you understand uh, you know how, how this diagonal uh, matrix formulation came about and how you actually show that this is indeed gives you each element of this matrix and again in theory we could have used the same back propagation that we did before but here we're trying to analyze uh, and really point out uh, you know how the vanishing or exploding gradient problem comes about so we'll actually you know take this uh, where you could in theory use like compute these Jacobians but it's just very inefficient to create these large matrices and the standard back propagation formulation that we had before will be much more efficient to implement yeah. another question This is still, yeah, this is still just a matrix product. So whenever we would have... These are also matrix uh, products, yep. Exactly, this will just be a big sequence of matrices, yep. And in fact, now we can uh, look at uh, or try to remember our knowledge uh, of, of norms or matrix norms. Uh, and we can analyze uh, this, uh, this matrix and the matrix multiplications. And so uh, one thing that we know from the norm is that when you have uh, a multiplication of two matrices, um, then there, the norm uh, is always l larger for the norms of the two matrices separately. And so now we can basically define uh, two beta values here. Uh, beta is just a number we define now. We can compute that, for instance. We take our W, we know exactly what our W is, and we just take the norm of that. So the simplest one, L2 norm, for instance, we would just basically sum up all the squared elements of um, the elements of, of W here. And now this one is also easy to compute an upper bound for uh, because we know F prime, for instance, in the case of the sigmoid or the 10H can only be so large, right? It's uh, you know, in the case of the sigmoid, it's like sigmoid of x times 1 minus sigmoid of x, right? And both are between 0 and 1. So we could basically define here the upper bound uh, for each of these Jacobians. And again, the Jacobians just being the derivatives, uh, all the single derivatives written out in the matrix. So now we can basically say that the overall gradient uh, that we want to have for an HT with respect to an HK that might be multiple time steps away is a product of these Jacobian matrices. Uh, and each, at each, each element of that product is associated with one step in the forward computation. And so when we compute an upper bound for this here, uh, we can basically plug those in. It's the same W, and this is one of the problems, the same W here at every time step. And we can also very easily define an upper bound for beta, beta H. And then we basically repeat that T minus K many time steps. So now <coughs> if your K is very small and your T is very large, you basically have here a very large um, you know, exponential um, where if now your beta W, your matrix, um, the norm of your matrix, the elements of your matrix are very small, then you will quickly take you know, the hundredth or two hundredths power of that very small number and basically very quickly goes to zero. Likewise, if your matrix weights are actually very large and you have here different kinds of nonlinearities, for instance, not uh, the sigmoid, but maybe rectified linear units that just are linear, um, for you know, when the input is larger than, than zero, then it could get very, very large. And so uh, that basically breaks yeah, the locality assumption that you do when you, have, uh, when you do gradient descent. So what do I mean by um, the locality assumption here? So generally, when we have some non-convex uh, decisions and we now make a gradient step here and we assume that with one small step in the right direction, we would just minimize it. But now uh, it's really so, it's such a jagged landscape that uh, really what could happen is that from here to here, it is actually a much, uh, it is not as smooth, but actually goes, you know, like, like this. And so then you make one little step and actually instead of minimizing here, um, you basically blow up and your error is much larger. Yes. Could you say again um, what the mathematical 
Sure. So basically, if the norm of your matrix W is much larger than 1, then here, and let's say your beta uh, H is also just around 1, or slightly larger than 1, then you have you know, 2 to the power of, and now some number of time steps, um, you know, let's say T is 200 and K is just 5 or something. So then we have 2 to the power of 195, and that blows up very quickly. Yes? That is an upper bound, but it's actually something that really happens in practice. Um, and yeah, so either either your W is very small, or like it almost doesn't matter how like as soon as it's less than one, it will go down a lot. As soon as it's larger than one, it will go up very quickly. Yes. Is the fan vanishing or the exploding gradient more pro problematic? Um, they're actually both problematic, um, but the exploding gradient one, if you don't deal with it, it'll just immediately after a couple of time steps. Uh, your, your gradients will go to not a number because you you run out um, of floating point operations. So in that sense, it's more dramatic. Um, however, it's so dramatic that if you have it, you immediately notice the problem and then you know you you try to fix it. Uh, the vanishing gradient problem is you think things are working, but really they aren't capturing it. So so when does this really like uh, when is this really problematic? Basically, if you have long term dependencies, and uh, I'll, I'll give some intuition very soon. Right is right now. Uh, basically, uh, are there any other questions sort of about the, the math before we go into some more intuitions? Um, uh, yeah. It's a little unclear to me how the exploded, exploding gradient would happen in a case where you have these sort of, you know, saturatable nonlinearities non where like it it's just kind of seems like if the magnitude of the hidden state is growing, then eventually you saturate, and then your gradient kind of flatlines. So the W, though, no matter what your uh, what your um, nonlinearity is, your W can have a norm larger than one. And then, if if that uh, the upper bound for this doesn't uh, you know isn't very very small, then you'll still have. Uh, All right. So basically, um, when when is this really a problem in practice? Uh, almost all the time, uh, largely uh, for the following reasons. So the error at a certain time step, you know, uh, ideally can tell you something about what to do in previous time steps that are maybe many many uh, you know time steps t away during back propagation. So let's take uh, a simple example here uh, for the vanishing gradient problem for for language models. Um, where ideally words that happen many time steps away will have a, you know, a potentially still big impact on the word you want to predict in the next time step. So let's say we have here Jane walked into the room, John walked into, it was late in the day, and you know, really here you could add a bunch of other things about the day and what kind of room it was and so on, and then Jane said hi too. Right? And now um, John happened multiple time steps away, in this case only, you know, uh, so like 5 to 10 or so, but really it could be 50. Right? You can talk a lot about the room first, and then you'd still ideally predict that she would say hi to John. And if you train, you would like to train the model such that now you want to lower the error, and the error is trying, is basically measuring how well you can predict that she would say hi to John, and now you have to propagate each of these will basically be corresponding to a hidden layer uh, and you know you have to go all the way back to here, and then tell the model that if you see some you know a name, then after you know you go through many many time steps, and then you see a sequence such as another name said hi to, you would want to give an increased probability to the last the latter name, right? And in theory, the models could pick that up, but in practice, that was very hard to do for a lot of people. And uh, that is largely because of you know, these vanishing and potentially uh, uh, exploding gradient problems. So to give you a little bit of intuition and also to bring uh, those people up to speed who had uh, trouble with the first problem set, let's go through a simple example of a clean neural network implementation. It won't be a recurrent one, because that's what you'll have to do yourself in the next problem set. Uh, so we'll just go through um, one that a standard neural network, but with two hidden layers, um, which you know 
even standard ones will have the vanishing gradient problem. They less often have the exploding gradient problem. And then uh, we can also compare uh, sigmoids and ReLU units, which uh, will, uh, especially for recurrent neural networks, um, will be very useful. All right, so let's go through this IPython notebook together. So, and uh, I think we'll we'll share this also um, on the on the website. So uh, you can you can go over this and, and see uh, a somewhat clean implementation. This uh, was done by uh, Namrata. Uh, started from uh, something that Andre Kapathy had written uh, for a previous class, and then I'll just modified it a little bit. So basically, here, okay, we'll just set up uh, some plotting. Now um, we create a data set. Uh, it looks very simple. Basically, it's this uh, spiral kind of data set, and we color here the different points based on what classes uh, they're in. So we assume here this part of the spiral is one class. We have red, blue, and yellow. And now we define uh, two types of nonlinearities here, uh, the sigmoid and the gradients. And again, uh, the ReLU here, which is just maximum of 0 or x. So very simple function. And uh, the gradient here is so simple, we don't really need to, uh, need to define it. Basically, 0 or 1. Um, oops. And now we'll define a three-layer neural network. Um, this will be a very simple definition here. We'll basically say, all right, we have a couple of um, 100 points per class. Well, this is not part of the neural network. But then uh, our dimensionality of the input is just two-dimensional. And we have three, three of these classes. And so now that basically define, like we'll, we'll say our first hidden layer is 50-dimensional. And our second layer is also 50-dimensional. So that's a lot of dimensions for uh, two-dimensional input would assume and hope to be able to overfit this uh, very easily. Now we'll just define here um, our model and all uh, the hidden sizes. And then we'll basically initialize all the weights. Um, sometimes I prefer actually initializing it by, by having a uniform uh, in, in a small range. But you can also use uh, Gaussian initialization, um, maybe make them a little larger than they are by default. <coughs> initialize all your biases to 0. Uh, all right, so now um, let's go for uh, 50,000 time steps. We basically do, do forward propagation. <coughs> forward propagation is simply you know, w1 times x plus b, just as we defined times an element-wise nonlinearity. And then we do the same thing for the second layer, w2 times uh, that hidden state plus b2. And the last layer here, in our case, uh, will first compute these linear scores by w3 times the hidden layer activation plus b3. And then we exponentiate that and divide by the sum of all the exponents. We could have written this out also as a separate softmax function. Um, is that clear so far? Are there any questions? All right. And this is ideally, you know, I mean, this is kind of this is how simple this, this is in the end, right? Like a three-layer neural network and forward propagation is literally three lines, um, if you have the right kind of auxiliary uh, helper functions defined properly. And ideally, when you implement this uh, next uh, problem sets, uh, this is also how simple it is. I, I love code where you actually see the equations from the lecture in, in, the, in the code. All right, so now um, we compute our cross-entropy loss. And compute our um, regularization. All right, now we'll go uh, and do backprop. Let's look mostly for the case of the sigmoids. Um, we basically have exactly that main equation um, for uh, internal layers that we described before, which is uh, W2 transpose times the delta messages, the delta error messages. Uh, and then element-wise uh, multiplication of uh, the f prime of the hidden layer. 
and you know simpler versions for the very first top one where you just have the gradient uh, times uh, well yeah I guess you have you can already have your deltas from your scores which in the case of the sigmoid was just a target minus the prediction all right so now here we have our standard delta which uh, standard backdrop that would def like derived uh, in detail in previous lectures all right and now uh, basically one thing we want to uh, plot here are the derivatives of uh, the weights of the first layer and uh, also of the second layer. And so, and then we'll, we'll make all our updates with SGD, and then we'll evaluate training accuracy here. All right, so now we ran this with the sigmoid network and with the rectified linear network. And here's basically like a simple plot of, uh, you know, the differences in the uh, norms of the gradients of the two layers. So the top uh, layer here, the second uh, hidden layer before or after the, um, after the softmax has a larger, much higher, uh, you know, gradients over time, uh, much larger gradients over time than the layer below that, the first hidden layer. And now imagine, you know, you have here some, some gap between those. Now imagine you actually repeat that 50 time steps, right? It'll just get smaller and smaller and then goes to zero. Um, the same is actually true for the rectified linear. However, there you have some things that go to zero, but others go perfectly through, perfectly fine through the network. So that's why rectified linears actually often have less of a problem with, uh, um, with the vanishing gradient problem. They're much more likely to actually have the exploding gradient problem because you don't uh, multiply the output. The output is basically you know, max 0x, and so this x can get very large, and you never cap it uh, as you do with, with the sigmoid. Um, but the, you know, in general, there's still some that go to zero, and so it does decrease uh, compared to other ones. Okay, so now uh, basically both can very well overfit this kind of simple data set with such a powerful neural network. Here's the sigmoid, and for the rectified linear units, you kind of see a little bit more sort of uh, straight lines, especially if this was a single layer, uh, like rectified linear, uh, a single layer neural network with rectified linear units as a nonlinearity, you'd see sort of more straight lines coming from this kind of nonlinearity. And I encourage you actually to, you know, potentially take out one hidden layer here and then, you know, see what, how well both of these models could still predict uh, this simple data set. All right, are there any questions about this example? Yeah. No, sorry. This is like it's uh, it's sort of it's not really a recurrent neural network. Uh, these are two different sets of weights. Uh, Same problem still happens. Exactly. Yeah. You, it's yeah. The like it doesn't happen. It's less likely to happen, but it's still uh, it'll still happen. Basically, that was the problem. So deep neural networks have existed a very very long time, and only in 2006, uh, Jeff Hinton and Rasan Salikutinov, his PhD student at the time, were able to make a deep neural network work at all for anything. Before that, they're just in theory so much better, but in practice, nobody was able to really optimize them because of these problems. And that was despite the fact that there are different weights at, at each layer. It's just uh, even more amplified because in recurrent neural networks, you essentially have deep, you know, the depth is like 1,000, right? Whereas in most neural networks that have different sets of, of weights, you usually have like two to, you know, maybe five, and I guess now for some uh, convolutional architectures, like 20 layers, but never thousands. Yeah. Great question. You go back to those two plots to see the relative position of the blue and green. Uh -huh. Are they deeper? So one is this one, and green is on the top. Uh -huh. And then for the next one. So both of them, the second layer is. Larger, have larger mm -hmm. Yeah, so the gradient here, the main error that you have is at the top of, of this network, and then as you go down, it basically vanishes as you go deeper and deeper. Go down, you mean it goes to the closer to the end? Or yeah, so 
we usually call um, this here is the highest layer, um, and this one is the first layer. So this is you know h1, h2, h3. All right. Are there any more questions? Yeah. No, are you going to share this um, Python? Notebook? Yeah, we'll share the Python notebook um, on the syllabus. All right. So, um, yeah, the, you know, you actually you saw one plot, and uh, if you just initialize it again, it may actually look like this. So it really it won't look exactly the way you saw it, right? Depending on the random initialization, like we we know we have these very you know non-convex uh, kinds of uh, energy landscapes, and so in some cases, uh, you know, this is what it looked like. Um, All right, so uh, now that we know what the problem is, how do we actually s fix the problem and uh, not suffer from that and actually get these models to work well? So, so far it was the theory, now uh, is the maybe not as beautifully uh, justifiable practice, uh, which is that um, one way to deal with the exploding, exploding gradient problem is the so-called clipping trick, which is really just saying we'll have a maximum value for every element of our gradient. It is really quite hacky. <laughs> so you just say your gradient is 1,000, mm, let's just set it to 5. <laughs> no matter how big it is. Um, and so that, that's really it. Uh, and you know, there's so much math that went into this, and so many people tried something, and then uh, Tomasz Mikulov here just said, well, let's just set it to five. Um, and literally three to five or so is a good maximum value for, for the gradient. Um, yeah? Um, yes, and there there's some interesting uh, sort of batch normalization kinds of ideas, but uh, yeah, um, for RNNs, this is this is the the default thing that everybody uses. Yeah. Nobody has tried that yet for recurrent neural networks to to try to normalize the error messages. The problem is like when you normalize that, you also mess with the gradient in even weirder ways, right? Now you now all the gradients of all the different elements, all the different elements of the gradient modify each other. And you might not necessarily want that, right? Maybe what you have is uh, you have uh, a gradient that is very, very large in, so let's say your, your gradient for your entire theta is you know, mostly reasonable values, but then one thing is just 1,000, right? And all the other values are actually reasonably, reasonably sized. Now, that will just you know, really mess up your thing, because once you update one of the weights to that, it will basically screw up everything else, and you get not a number very quickly in your implementation. And so now we'll just you know, set this to 5. Uh, so uh, this was you know, quite unsatisfactory, um, but was what actually worked for a very long time. And so uh, one nice paper um, for out of Yoshua Benjo's group uh, is basically tried to basically try to analyze a little bit at least what's going on here and they implemented a very simple recurrent neural network uh, and this is actually something that I encourage you always to do too if you want to gain some intuition of what's going on you can always just implement a tiny tiny network um, and then see really exactly what happens to every single number in your network you can visualize it and so on and this is what they did here so basically they had um, a single hidden layer um, sorry, not a single hidden layer, but a single unit um, recurrent neural network, but many time steps. And they basically just wanted to uh, predict some output, but it depended on some time steps, uh, many steps before. And so as they visualized, this is basically exactly this sort of non-convex kind of decision surface that we have. So this is our J, uh, for instance, cross entry pair, something like that but in this case with you know, vocabulary of size one. Um, and, uh, or, well, I guess the softmax could have whatever, any number of weights, but here we basically just plot the values of W. So each W here has a uh, specific, and, and uh, the bias term here, 
um, basically comes with a specific uh, element of your, your energy landscape here. And basically, uh, the solid line uh, that you see here is what happens when you do your standard gradient descent. And after you hit this high curvature wall uh, in your objective function, basically jumps all the way somewhere else. And it's totally messed up. Whereas uh, when you rescale it to a fixed size, it basically doesn't jump around that far and stays uh, somewhere where it's reasonable to, in the end, try to minimize uh, this error here. So imagine you try to minimize this error. You took a tiny step here, and now it sends you all the way somewhere entirely different. So this is at least some intuition of what, what we gain from the gradient clipping. Yes? So uh, the question, if I understood you correctly, is what's the intuition when you have multiple hidden uh, units in the recurrent layers? Um, uh, I mean, basically, we, we think the same kinds of curvature walls happen, but just now in a, a much higher dimensional space. Um, and we can't visualize them anymore. Yeah. Yes? Parameters have a lot of dimensions. Do mm -hmm. you just scale one of the dimensions that is pretty large and keep the rest the same? Yes, uh, you could um, you could do that. So uh, the most common one here, they, they have a, a slight uh, slight modification to that. But the most common one is literally to just have your gradient each element i of this is just the max of uh, sorry, the minimum of five comma that gradient. Yeah. Yes. Uh, where's, where's the actual minimum when it's energy surface? Is it the crease between the? Yeah, exactly. The, yeah, it's somewhere down like right here. Okay, so if you kept the optimizing, you didn't change the learning rate at all. Um, even with the clipping, so you would essentially hit the minimum and then hit the wall, but then you wouldn't jump back as far. Exactly, yeah. And that is, again, for one dimension. You would probably think it's even more complex, and maybe there are some crevices and so on. Um. Cool, OK. So the, that was the trick uh, to solve the exploding gradient problem. Now, the vanishing gradient um, actually also has a couple of different people have different uh, ways of trying to, to fix that. There's actually one um, that seems very promising that just came out uh, in its, its uh, latest sort of version literally two weeks ago uh, by a friend of mine, Kwok Lee. Um, uh, basically, two, two things. One, we can initialize our uh, hidden to hidden W to be the identity matrix. That is the, the first thing. That way, you as you combine uh, the next step, you kind of just average things in the beginning, and then you go from there. And the other one is to use the rectified linear units instead of sigmoid or 10H units. And the rectified linear units, essentially the derivative is, e is either 0 or it's 1. And when the derivative is 1, you can nicely propagate that error through to previous time steps. And if it's 0, you just stop, and that unit is basically gone. But for those units that aren't set to 0, the gradient nicely propagates all the way to, to previous time steps. And so here's uh, one plot um, for a somewhat artificial problem. Um, I guess uh, I can briefly talk about this. This is uh, basically a pixel by pixel permuted MNIST. So MNIST is a very simple data set of just digits. Uh, deep learning community had worked on it uh, a little, like, far too long. Um, and here, uh, the, the main problem is you go over all the digits of the pixels, all the pixels, and each pixel is one time step. And then you try to essentially predict what the number is in the end after going through all these time steps, right? So you have like 700 or so pixels, and you go through 700 time steps. It's, it's a very artificial problem, but it's still kind of hard, because you need to keep around, you know, what have you seen before in like 100 times steps before. It, it, makes, it makes the problem artificially hard, but very easy to analyze. And so if you use this uh, identity-initialized uh, recurrent neural network, um, 
you basically uh, can get much higher uh, test accuracies than if you used uh, a standard uh, RNN with 10H units. And uh, LCMs, which work actually incredibly well in some, some problems, and we'll cover them soon, um, do better than these other methods, but not as well as this simple, uh, simple trick of just identity initialization and rectified linear units. Um, but that's, again, just for this uh, particular synthetic problem. Uh, this is actually an idea that I first introduced, but in the uh, framework of recursive neural networks, which we'll uh, also talk either next uh, lecture or next week about. Um, and then, uh, again, there's some new experiments with recurrent neural networks uh, just two weeks ago. Yes? So one, I guess, you know, when we looked at all these Jacobians, right, we had uh, basically your, it's close to, to one, the norm. So that's, that's one. Uh, and I guess the, the other one is that uh, when you initialize the entire matrix completely randomly, then your first sort of transformation from this hidden layer to that other hidden layer is a completely random projection, right? Like you have a bunch of random numbers and you basically randomly project them to the next hidden state. If, the identity, if it's the identity matrix, then what happens in... What happens here is basically that it's just going to be this plus, and let's, let's assume this was also the identity matrix, right? Then um, this would basically just be an average um, times two, of, of the current word vector and the previous hidden state. And so that essentially um, doesn't, it doesn't as randomly project um, your hidden states as it would if you just had a bunch of random numbers in your WHH and basically make sure that your current input really has a reasonable modification um, to the hidden state instead of a completely random projection in the beginning. So in, in the beginning, you kind of just average out a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think in the recursive neural network setting, um, it's actually even more intuitive, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, soon. Yes? So, uh, so you talked about um, uh, like nonlinear choice and this great clipping thing. Um, is, what about like regularization? Are there uh, forms of regularization that can specifically target the vanishing or exploding gradient problem? Um, so you do usually have your standard L2 regularization on all these weights as well. And you would hope it helps, but it, it can't help enough because of these you know, many multiplied Jacobians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, uh, it seems like you want to, like, these things seem to be suggesting you want to like kind of weakly enforce some constraint on especially the recurrent matrix, like that it should kind of weakly belong to some family of matrices. Right. Yeah, you could maybe try to have some, some interesting norm regularization on something. Um, People tried a lot of different things. So uh, one of the things we, I guess, had uh, skipped for time constraints is dropout, for instance, uh, where you basically turn off half of your hidden units randomly, and then you multiply your weights at test time, uh, or you divide them by two. And so that actually doesn't help for recurrent neural networks either. So um, at least there's uh, some one paper that suggests that it's not very helpful. Yes? Uh, I think they might still use the gradient clipping to, to deal with that. Yeah. Cool. OK, so we talked about um, you know, sort of traditional count-based language models. Uh, the, and uh, the one that works best, we don't have to go into the details because it's not going to be that important for the class, but it's called knesser -Nay. It's a specific type of smoothing and a combination of backoffs. And really, beyond five grams, nobody can keep around. Uh, nobody had enough RAM, uh, especially not in 2011, uh, to keep around uh, these kinds of language models for more than a window of five words before. And uh, here is basically uh, a baseline. And again, this is uh, the perplexity. And this is on two different corpora, the pen, pen tree bank, and the switchboard, uh, which is a um, uh, corpus of for speech recognition, 
and uh, the lower is better. And here we have basically the traditionally best method with 141 and the recurrent neural network trained with backpropagation, which is called backpropagation through time. But really, it's the same kind of delta messages that we've computed before. Uh, it's just, again, matrix derivatives. Uh, and it basically has a much, much lower perplexity on both of these data sets compared to the previous one. And so, you know, why, why, why does this work? I guess another level of intuition here is that uh, these word vectors are very powerful, right? And instead of seeing, having to see exactly, you know, I loved my pet cat um, something, I could now, like, seeing I love my pet cat and I love my pet dog are very similar to, uh, to a neural network because cat and dog have similar word vectors. And the word vectors here can also be learned in the recurrent neural network. So in all the equations that we wrote out um, here, we could take derivatives with respect to x also and actually learn word vectors through a recurrent neural network. We don't have to always just use, um, you know, glove or word to vec um, and initialize them. We could also initialize the words randomly here and take derivatives with respect to x. Um, but basically, as we do that, uh, similar words have similar vectors and hence similar probabilities for, for being seen, and that helps, um, helps the perplexity. We can basically give I love my pet dog a higher probability because we have seen I love my pet cat. All right. Um, yeah. I actually think that uh, um, it looked like, uh, and originally um, in his early papers, uh, he kind of propagated only a certain number of time steps uh, by hand. But really, and this is, I guess, something I'll, I'll mention here, which is uh, you really need to only do one pass uh, backwards through your entire sequence once. So uh, what do I mean by this? So as we have here our hidden layers, Right, and we have forward propagation. Now I have a new error at every time step. So at ht minus 1, et, et minus 2, and so on. And now I add my deltas here. So this, these are my delta error messages, just as before with the standard neural networks. And now here I have a new delta message coming from this. And now instead of doing this once, propagating once this error through the entire network and ignoring everything else and making one update step, and then taking this one and doing everything. You can really just do one pass and you just add your delta messages as they come. And you know each of these here now is basically the accumulated sum of all of these. And so uh, originally, I think Mikulov didn't realize this trick and uh, um, and just propagate it for a fixed set of, of time steps. All right, so one problem that these generally deep learning models uh, have when it comes to predicting uh, the entire vocabulary is that the larger your vocabulary, and ideally you want to have your vocabulary be millions, uh, the larger your final matrix multiplication is for your softmax, right? The softmax has number of outputs, number of rows, is the number of words in your vocabulary times your hidden unit. Now, your hidden units might be a thousand, and you have a million words in your vocabulary. So that's a million times a thousand dimensional matrix, and you have to multiply all of it all the time which is horribly slow, right? There's a, there's a lot of uh, multiplication inside. And so one way to, to deal with that is, is a nice trick, um, also coming from Mikulov, who really spent many years on just you know, recurrent neural networks for language modeling. This was basically his entire thesis. Um, and one, one neat trick is to basically use class-based word prediction. So you basically try to predict uh, the word at time step t, given the history, but now you will basically uh, factorize this and say, I basically first predict a class given the history, and then I predict the word given this class. So now the word given the class, let's say each class has maybe a thousand words in that class, and I have a thousand classes, right? Now I will basically have a million vocabulary, but for one class, I only need to do backprop and multiplication for exactly that class. 
And in our case, the history is just the previous hidden vector HT. And so if you have the number of classes is the same as your vocabulary, then you don't get anything. And with fewer and fewer classes, uh, you basically um, can get a nice speed up, but also you have a drop or an increase in your perplexity. Yes? How do you estimate the P of the word given the class? Is it, do you also take into account the history? Or? No, it's just at that point, you just for this class, um, you have, I mean, you could make it again uh, a neural network and, and do it that, but usually you have a, a fixed cutoff in order to not, in order to be able to ignore the entire rest of, of everything. So now we basically don't have to do this gigantic matrix uh, product. OK, I um, already covered that one. So now one nice thing is we've talked mostly about language modeling. And this really only because it's a nice basic task. In some ways, it's actually an intermediate task. Um, you, could, you could assume in some abstract world, it is actually a task that solves all of NLP. Right? If you could perfectly predict every word that comes after uh, that comes next why not build a question answering system or a machine translation system that asks what's the translation of the following sentence and then it would you know predict that translation but in practice that doesn't actually work uh, the language models for the most part are only able even the recurrent setting even this you know in theory we could keep track of all the history in practice the history is not five like with traditional models but maybe seven to at most 15 or so and after that we can't really take into consideration uh, what happened before but these kinds of models are a lot more useful for basically any other task and not just predicting the next word but also predicting for every single word uh, some kind of output so the task that we've looked at before a lot is named entity recognition or NER and we can use recurrent neural networks also to predict named entity tags so at every time step instead of trying to predict the next word we can just try to predict a specific label um, we can do that also for entity level sentiment so let's say you have something like I like the screen of the iPhone but I didn't like its keyboard or something now you can say screen is positive in this context and now the recurrent neural network can capture that context for you and classify that word in, well, so far in our standard RNN only based on the left context. Uh, one particular example here uh, comes from uh, uh, Ozan Irzoy, who's a PhD student right now at Cornell. Um, well, right now he's an intern at MetaMind. But, um, uh, and so he's uh, basically uh, published his nice paper last year on opinion mining with deep recurrent neural networks. And so what does he try to classify? basically tries to classify each word um, as belonging to either of three classes. The first one is none of the above, or no, not an opinion, opinion word. Uh, and the other two are a direct subjective expression or an expressive subjective expression. So what do I mean by this? Basically a DSE or direct subjective expression is an explicit mention of a private state or speech event. And an ESE, or expressive subjective expression, is an expression that indicates some kind of sentiment or emotion. So like, you know, awesome is, is uh, a positive emotion, but without explicitly conveying them. So let's look at an, an actual example. So here we have, for instance, the committee, as usual, has refused to make any statements. So now, as usual, is essentially uh, an expression that indicates some sentiment. In this case, it's kind of negative and here has refused to make any statements is uh, basically a direct um, subjective expression. So one commonly used notation that you should know uh, is the bio notation, which is uh, a way to describe the labels for every word such that you can actually also label longer phrases. It's a very simple one. It basically has uh, three types of labels, the beginning, B, of any kind of uh, type of tag and the continuation of that kind of tag I and O for none of those kinds of labels. So as usual is the beginning of an ESE and uh, to as is the beginning and usual is the continuation. And this whole phrase has basically one specific label as well. 
so now uh, the recurrent neural network that he defines is very similar to the one that we've defined before. And I'm trying to use the notation from the paper so that you can kind of start to see past the specific W superscript HH, for instance. So our W superscript HH is uh, his V, and our W superscript HX is his W here. So you know, don't be confused. What we define for our vanishing gradient uh, formulation, for instance, that we skipped here. We had uh, W was the HH instead of uh, being the one multiplied by X. But once you see X here and once you see H here, you can kind of know which W's um, and what the parameters mean and what they're used for. He has the same notation f for, for nonlinearities, and instead of writing out softmax here, he uses the function g. And his softmax weights, which we often use uh, w superscript s for, uh, for him is a u. But once you see, oh, he has a recurrent neural network, and you see those equations, you should kind of be able to just see past, uh, past the syntax and, and understand uh, that we really have the same semantics here and the same kind of model. And instead of having you know, lot of, lots, of, lots of little dots here for each vector, he describes each vector as just a single dot. Again, you'll, you'll observe that in the literature a lot. But other than that, the H is still sort of our memory that is computed from past memories and so on. There's, uh, there are two interesting tricks and modifications to the RNN that uh, he didn't necessarily invent. There are other people who have uh, introduced these before, but uh, he had used them nicely for a different kind of task. Uh, the first one is the idea of having bidirectional recurrent neural networks. So instead of just having your hidden state be dependent on the left side, you now have another recurrent neural network that just basically turns around your text and goes from the end to the beginning. And so you have HT forward, um, or left to right, uh, which is basically a standard RNN. And you have an HT right to left, which is also a standard RNN that just happens to go in the opposite direction. Same, same idea, same equations, same math, same back propagation. You just you know, back propagate past each other. And your final prediction can now come from the left pass and the right pass. And again, backpropagation, everything is the same. We just take matrix derivatives here. And now comes the second modification, which is you can have a deep bidirectional recurrent neural network. And now you start to understand why you really want to understand, why you just want to have uh, this intuition of, oh, I have my delta error messages, and they just come from various places, and I just add them, right? And this is why we went through these first basic ingredients and basic Lego pieces so carefully, because now it just goes, it, it, you know, models become more and more complex. But again, it's just a bunch of matrix multiplications. It just happens to be that for a certain state in the forward propagation, if it's in a higher layer, it will now depend on the previous HT minus one, as well as the HT of the layer below at the same time step. And uh, maybe at this point we'll stop and we'll look at uh, his evaluation and so on in the next class. Thanks.